Hey guys, and welcome to another video. This one, part of our educational series on Walther PPs and PPKs. I usually like to show you a gun and then tell you a story. Today, I'm gonna to reverse it. I'm gonna tell you a story and then show you some guns, mostly Walther PPs and PPKs. The story is what happened to the Walther factory at the end of the war. It's a great story, and actually I want to thank Ron Claren, uh, who is a moderator for the P-38 Forum on the internet. If you look at the P-38 Forum, he's a moderator on there, and he did a lot of research on what happened to the Walder factory at the end, and that really came out of the fact that his uncle was in the 90th Indi Infantry Division and was one of the people who occupied the factory at the end of the war. So he gathered a lot of this research and actually got some of the vets to tell stories and write letters. Uh, I'm going to go over some of that with you. So I, I printed off what he put together. It's an article online, and this is, uh, it's like, uh, I don't know how many pages, but it's a lot of research that he put together about the Walder Factory. You can see a picture here of the Walder Factory. It was actually many buildings. It was a sprawling complex, which became more and more busy uh, during the war years and certainly toward the end of the war. It was the uh, 90th Infantry Division and the 11th uh, Armored Division that rolled up to uh, the Zellamelis town and factory on April 4th of 1945. So right at the end of the war, April 4th, they rolled in. A lot of different r units rolled in and rolled out over various times. There's letters from different people who came in. Uh, what, I, what I notice is nobody stayed there very long, that these troops were constantly on the move. But the first elements that came into the factory uh, they said they were met uh, by, you know, as they went into the town of Zellamelis, which was actually two towns that had been combined. Fritz Walder, the head of the Walder factory, and the mayor of the town, I think they called him the Burgermeister, they actually met the uh, Americans at, at the entrance of the town and told them that they surrendered. Uh, they, of course, had been told by the SS to fight to the last man. Everybody was to sacrifice their life for the fatherland. They had, in fact, three divisions of Volkssturm, uh, which were actually, you've seen pictures of the young boys, uh, sometimes girls and older men, people who were not uh, able to be in the army yet. They were called the, the, Civil, the Civil Defense League, uh, Volkssturm, and they were told to defend the, to the last man. Now, actually, there were many battles where the Volkssturm did fight to the last man, uh, particularly in Ber Berlin, uh, and it was basically carnage because they were outgunned and outmanned. But when uh, they came to this town and several other towns. The, uh, the, the, the mayor of the town would just surrender just to keep all those young boys and women and older men from being killed. And plus he knew the town would be destroyed. The, the armored division and the infantry would have completely overwhelmed and destroyed the town. Uh, so they were trying to avoid that. Uh, we actually did a video called The Reluctant Nazi that had a similar story where the, uh, the mayor and uh, Hans Plesch surrendered the town of Munich, the entire city of Munich, so much bigger city. Uh, so that, that happened in some of the circumstances. The, the, some of the Nazis were actually giving up, and some of them did give their life. We'll do another video about some of the party leaders. So when, uh, when Fritz Walther and the mayor surrendered the town, uh, they, they actually took the mayor in a jeep and they drove him around the town. They said it was like a ghost town when they first came in. There's actually letters here that describe it was like a, the town was like a ghost town. There was nobody there. Uh, the Volksturm actually exited. They, they left the city to go fight someplace else or, or go back home to their mommies. I'm not sure. But uh, they, they left the town. Uh, the place was a ghost town, but the mayor, they took the mayor all around the town with a loudspeaker saying, you know, surrender, come forward. And they said people just came out of the, the houses uh, waving white flags uh, in surrender. Uh, they got to the factory, and one of the first things they did is they, uh, they wanted to get the, the Walder brothers. Uh, Fritz Walder had several brothers. I think it was three brothers uh, who all worked at the factory. They all surrendered. They drove them to their homes and asked them to surrender their weapons, which I think was pretty strategic in terms of getting souvenirs because they said their houses were filled with all kinds of treasures of uh, engraved guns and rifles and presentation pieces. I actually have seen um, guns, uh, very expensive guns, that had notes saying this came from one of the Walder uh, brothers' homes at the end of the war. So the GIs brought them home. Uh, it's often not well documented, but I've, so I've always been skeptical. How would you know unless you had the serial numbers? 
But they did, uh, the Walder brothers uh, surrendered all their weapons, as did uh, most of the town. So then the guys begin to go into the factory. And what happened was the first guys that came through just started grabbing guns. I actually have letters, I'll read a few, where they just started grabbing things and stick them in their bags or their pockets, uh, four and five guns at a time, uh, getting what they could. But as, the, uh, as they, ro again, they rolled in and out, so they got what they could, but then they had to leave. When the next group came in, they actually began to post guards. Uh, post guards, for one reason, the, uh, the slave laborers, actually foreign Polish, mostly foreign Polish laborers, who there's about a thousand of them, they wanted to destroy the equipment. That's documented. They wanted to destroy the equipment. So the American army had to post guards to uh, protect the Walder family from being killed. It actually says that they wanted to kill the Walder family and uh, to protect the equipment because they, they wanted to, uh, there was a lot of prototypes and a lot of blue, blueprints that they wanted to see what technologies that Walder was working on. I actually read one letter that said they found a, a robot flying machine. Well, today we would call that a drone, uh, but evidently Walder was experimenting with radio technology uh, drones. Uh, so pretty cool stuff. And intelligence units came in. They talk about that. The intelligence units came in to question some of the workers about some of the new designs. So that was all part of the capture of the Walder factory. So when I uh, read some of these letters, I'll just pull out some highlights, but they talk about going through the uh, factory. And you can see, hear the amazement in their voice about all the weapons they found. Again, it's a huge complex. And they just went from building to building with thousands and thousands of guns. I actually, uh, a, a friend of mine uh, gave this to me. It's a it's one of the souvenirs from one of the people that went through the factory. It's a piece of glass from broken glass. So it was probably a display case or something like that. Uh, and the GIs were just grabbing any souvenir. So I could see somebody breaking a display case. This says Walder Waffen. So it, it uh, came from the Walder factory. Uh, a GI brought it home as a souvenir. So let me read one of my favorite letters from a Sergeant Harry Schaefer who was there at the time. And he recalls his story of uh, being in the Walder factory. We took the Walder family uh, and put them in the jailhouse to keep the liberated Polish slave laborers from killing them. I believe there was over a thousand of them that we liberated. I, Sergeant Harry Schaefer, was guarding a prisoner who was a private until the OSS came to pick him up. They wanted him for interrogation. When they picked him up, I asked the uh, translator to tell the prisoner that I was a Jew. When he heard this, he broke down and cried. So actually, this was an interview that was written down with Sergeant Llewellyn. And he, he talks about coming into the factory, uh, th that they surrendered. And then he said, I took seven pistols. Uh, these were PPs and PPKs. I took seven pistols from the factory that day. He, he told me that he realized he couldn't carry them all. <laughs> so uh, he handed five of them over to tank guys. Uh, must have been from the 11th Armored Division. Sergeant Llewellyn was in the 90th Infantry, and he was handing out guns to the guys in the tanks. It was nice of him. He ended up with two that he put in his duffel bag to take home. He said later on, when he looked, at one gun had been stolen, and so he was left with one more. Um, he gives a serial number. I actually looked up that gun, and it would have been a Waffen uh, PP from about 1943. So why it was in the factory, we're not sure, but it, was a, it would have been a Waffen-proof PP that he brought home with him. Another GI uh, by the name of Joe Carey, he actually must have been charged with doing inventory because he talks about finding uh, a large cache of weapons. There were 1,600 P-38s. There were almost 5,000 PPs and PPKs. Uh, there were sniper, sniper rifles, some with scopes and some without scopes, but they were about 2,000 of them uh, put together and complete, probably K-43s. Uh, there was also some experimental guns, including about uh, 2,000 machine guns in various stages of being uh, assembled. So what did they find when they came to the factory? I, I've got some guns here that were actually taken from the factory by the GIs. How, how do I know that? Well, these had to have been in the factory. Here's two PPs. Um, you'll notice it's, it's kind of got uh, crude machining. Uh, they have the wooden, um, wooden grips because the... Uh, uh, black plastic was in short supply. It required oil, and of course they were running out of oil. It's a, a petroleum product, uh, so they were making wood grips at that point. And what these two guns have in common, if you look at the reverse, there are no proof marks. If you look at a, a common PP, you'll see it has a, a proof mark in the ejection chamber and on the slide. These have no proof marks. They also are marked AC, which was the code for the Walder factory. 
on the side where there usually was a legend, these are completely blank. So they, they skipped the legend, they skipped uh, the proof marks. The GI said that they found uh, P38s, PPs in crates ready to be shipped. All matching one would have been uh, put together by the factory workers and ready to be shipped. Um, the ones that are mismatched are considered correct mismatched in that they may have been put together by GIs. Uh, some people say the GIs didn't have time for that um, and that actually the Polish workers were putting them together um, and giving them to the Americans as souvenirs and probably uh, doing that for a pack of cigarettes or a loaf of bread. Um, so they were working putting together these, these mismatched uh, PPs. Now, the PPKs, we need to talk about that a little bit because I know for, I'm, I'm sure that the PPs were produced all the way to 1945, but I believe PPK production stopped in uh, about the middle of 1944. So there were some PPKs still in the factory, but they were no longer being made. Um, by the way, there was Model 6s in the factory, Model 9s, Model 4s. So guns that had ceased production were still in the factory. A lot of times there was something wrong with them. They were there for parts or they're being repaired. Um, we do find PPKs that were in the factory at the end of the war. This one uh, has no serial number. Again, they put a 53 on there. Probably it was number 53 put together by one of the Polish workers. Um, and he just marked it uh, 53. No slide legend, no serial number other than the 53, no firing proofs. Now here's what's incredible about this one. The ejector, you can see it's fire blued. They only fire blued them in pre-war guns, so that was got to be a leftover part. Uh, we have a blued hammer, a blued trigger guard. Um, we have a gray grip, beautiful gray grip, which was made in, that was made probably in around 42, 43 and a gray finger extension, which is very rare. Just, just having these, they, of course, at the end of the war, they would have all been black. So this was put together from parts. And finally, to one other cool piece is, uh, if you look at the safety, it's actually engraved. So they got an engraved safety, um, a uh, Doral frame, um, put it on a, a steel slide and a, a gray grip and brought this one home. Another very rare gun that was picked up by the GIs um, was an experimental gun, and there were experimental guns, and in particular, uh, the intelligence officers were interested in these experimental guns. This is a KPK, very rare. I think there's only three that are known. This KPK, the theory is, and first of all, they never went into regular production, but the Germans worked on these for a bit. The theory is, and, and I heard this from Ian uh, from uh, Forgotten Weapons, a uh, great uh, YouTube channel if you want to check him out. He did a different KPK, uh, and his theory was, and I'm sure he heard it from somebody, that uh, the idea was when you got, uh, for, tank, uh, for tankers and for pilots, when you got in and out, if you caught this on, it was tight fit, and you catch this on the edge of the door or something, and it, it gets the hammer, uh, it could accidentally discharge, theoretically. Not sure if that's true. I won't try it out. Um, so what they did is they just extended this back piece so that it kind of protected it from accidental discharge. But it is, it is a PPK frame. This one is actually um, aluminum, uh, Doral. And then the slide was altered, and they called it a KPK. Again, it has a Walder banner, probably made sometime during the war, uh, but then never put into production. This actually does have a serial number on it, which is certainly not factory. My best guess is somebody wanted to bring it home, and uh, whoever was in charge that day said, you can't bring it in without a serial number. Uh, that was not uncommon. I've heard that before. So they just stamped a number on there to, in order to import it into the United States. Interestingly, it has a party leader grip on it. This was not issued to a party leader. Again, my get, and look, this, this uh, <laughs> magazine doesn't even fit right. Um, it looked like it was made for a different gun. And in fact, it probably was. So my guess is this was in pieces. At the end of the war, somebody just put it together. Uh, the, the frame may not have even been with the slide, so somebody found the slide, put it on here, put together a magazine, and found a party leader grip in the factory at the end of the war, stuck it on there because it looks really cool, and brought it home. So that was probably brought home by a GI. 
Those are some of the PPs and PPKs that were found in the factory, but what about the P38s? Now there's some P38 collectors that are highly insulted that I didn't start with P38s. I'm, I'm a member of the P38 forum, so I love P38s as well. But my first love has always been while they're PPs and PPKs. This is from 1945. Uh, you can take a look and you'll see that it's dated AC45, AC Walder Factory, uh, 45 is the year. And it's in the C block, which the C block would have been April. Uh, they made a about 10,000 guns per month and the C block would have been the month of April. And, and since this was early April, remember they came in on April 4th, this is number 1,000. Uh, 23. Um, and you can see there's a combination of phosphated parts. Um, you can see the slide release and the trigger are phosphated. Uh, the extractor is phosphated. Um, beautiful gun, beautiful grips, but crude machining. If we look at the right side of the slide, normally there would be three proofs. This one only has one which means it probably was never finished. Uh, certainly it was never issued. And so we know this was uh, picked up by the GIs at the end of the war and never issued in April of 1945. I hope you enjoyed this video. I have a lot more to say about end of war guns. I'll do a separate one on some of the engraved, some of the engraved guns that were picked up at the end of the war, including the one that belonged to uh, Lieutenant Colonel James Sinclair. I'll talk a little bit about that one. Uh, all engraved guns that were found in the factory at the end of the war. Thanks for watching and uh, please subscribe, tell your friends, uh, and stay tuned for more. If you're like me and you can't get enough of this stuff, click here to subscribe. That way we'll send you notification when we do something new or click one of these buttons for recommended videos.